Hi, everybody, and welcome to the, uh, the second of uh, this year's uh, Covey Lecture Series presentations. Um, my name is Dan Dakin, and I'll be your moderator and, and host here for today. Um, the lecture today will run about uh, 45 minutes, and uh, then we'll have a bit of a question and answer period um, after that. So please, as you're watching, feel free to type in questions into the, uh, the little chat box at the side of uh, the, the live stream window here. Um, and I'll be happy to pass those questions along at the end of the presentation. So uh, for today, I'm very pre pleased to uh, welcome uh, Brock University professor, Michael Ripmeister. I messed up your name already, Michael, I apologize. <laughs> I, I tried to say it right, didn't work. Anyway, Professor uh, Michael Ripmeister will uh, uh, present his research that he did with Associate Professor Russell Johnson uh, titled Grapes, Wine and Public Memory. So a few words about the, the two professors here. So uh, Michael is a professor in the Department of Geography and Tourism Studies and is affiliated with Covey and the Social Justice Research Institute um, right here at Brock University. His research interests lie in the areas of cultural and historical ge geography. Uh, together with friend and colleague, Russell Johnson, uh, the two explored how residents of the Niagara region engage with various memory products, such as monuments and historic sites. Through this research, they became fascinated with how Niagara residents seem to connect with the wine industry as a heritage narrative. Michael and Russell have published extensively on this research, uh, most recently writing a book on collective memory in Niagara uh, that is now in the publication process with the University of Toronto Press. Um, now, uh, Russell, who is on the, the call here with us today um, uh, and is listening in. Um, Russell is an associate professor in the Department of Communication, Pop Culture and Film here at Brock. Uh, he is a, hist a cultural historian who has explored the roles and impact of the mass media in Canadian society. He's the author of Selling Themselves, The Emergence of Canadian Advertising, and has served as a consultant or invited speaker with the National Library and Archives of Canada, CBC Radio One, the Globe and Mail, Advertising Standards Canada, Marketing Ma Magazine, Mackenzie Heritage Printery, and elsewhere. So with that, I will turn the mic over to Professor Ripmeister. And now one quick note for today, we did have a little bit of a technical issue, so I'll be sharing my screen uh, with, the, with the slides and uh, I'll be advancing them on. So uh, hopefully that'll work out for us okay here today. And uh, um, if anyone's seeing any issues, please feel free to drop us a, a note in the chat there. But uh, with that, over to you. Thanks, Dan, and thanks for the introduction. As you just heard, my name is Mike Ritmeister, and I'm here today to talk about research that my friend and colleague, Russell Johnson, and I have been doing since about 2003. The title is different from the one I submitted to Sarah some months ago. I couldn't find the uh, email that I sent her, um, but the title that I'm using today is close, and it is also the title of the book that Dan mentioned. I'm gonna be doing a bit more of a formal presentation here as we move through virtual meetings and such. I found it really weird to just sort of talk in front of no one. Um, the presentation has also suffered from some irresolvable technical glitches, so it will rely, as Dan mentioned, on some coordination between Dan and I. So please bear with what might be a rather stiff presentation. Dan, could I have a slide, please? Before beginning, we would like to acknowledge the contributions of those who have made this work possible. First of all, thanks to Covey for the invite to talk today, and in particular, thanks to Debbie Ingalls. Debbie has long supported the work that Russell and I have been doing. We also acknowledge the support of Popular Culture Niagara, and this is the group in which Russell and I started to do this research. We need to acknowledge the financial support of SSHRC and Chris. Without these funds, the, the research would have never happened. The research would have never been successful also without the efforts of a horde of research assistants drawn from amongst the undergraduate and graduate students in our program. And finally, this research has benefited from friends and colleagues who've offered much advice, suggestions, and support over the many years that we've been pursuing it. Slide please, Dan. This wasn't supposed to be research about wine a conversation in a hallway 
started when Russell and I talked about a research project, and it started us down the path in which we explored collective memory and people's perceptions of official versions of it. Our original question was, what do people make of monuments and other historic sites? In fact, the research began with our thinking about the monument to Private Watson, who stands in downtown St. Catharines, and who has been the subject of much recent and lively debate. We started out by designing surveys in which we hoped we would learn how Ni Niagarans engaged with the region's storied past, things like the War of 1812 and the Underground Railroad. We were somewhat shocked to find that most Niagarans that we surveyed over the years were not particularly attached to these officially sanctioned narratives. Not even the War of 1812 Bicentennial shifted this very much. Instead, people mostly talked about contemporary events, people, and things. And one of the most frequent of these responses was grapes and wine. In the end, we simply could not avoid thinking about grapes and wine and vineyards in our research. They had, to put it very simply, become part of the collective history narrative of Niagara. Slide, please. We started out the research with a number of key concepts in tow. First, we were interested in collective memory, and in particular, the ways in which collective memory is subject to power and the ways in which it ties into identity. As scholars across disciplines suggest, getting people to know themselves through their past is a key part of creating and maintaining identities at all scales. In other words, we were thinking about the ways in which powerful groups produce the memories that shape people's conceptions of themselves. As part of this, we drew upon the literature of affect. There's no time to get into that here, but there are three important elements that we might um, talk about. The first is the weight of authority, and this is true of all forms of memory. Whether it is a government or a family matriarch, stories of our past become more legitimate if they're told by trusted authorities. Second, these stories also work, work best if they're told across various formats, and this is what we call intertextuality. So stories and monuments, or sorry, sorry, sorry <laughs> Historic stories that are told in monuments, in stamps and coins, and in the media and in museums are more likely to catch hold than stories that are not. And third and finally, there's resonance. The stories that move us, that have some kind of impact on us, will be more likely to take hold than our stories, than do stories that do not. Slide please, Dan. These ideas carried across to our choice of methods. We decided to use surveys in order to catch as large a data set as possible. Over the years, we have collected thousands of surveys from residents across the region. We used Likert scales, ranking types of questions, and followed these with open-ended questions in which people could elaborate on their answers. However, as we progressed, we were also painfully aware that our surveys, the questions, and the ways in which we carried them out might influence the data that we were collecting. Thus, after our first survey, the results of which really surprised us, we sat down and thought about our questions and tried to think about how they might have impacted responses. We then revised the question and tried again. We went through this cycle on five occasions. While this did render our survey sort of useless in terms of longitudinal study, it did make us more confident in the overall trajectory of the results. Slide, please. We haven't got time to display all of the data. However, this table represents one of the widest coverages of surveys across Niagara. We began every survey with a question that was designed to capture how people thought of the region. We always used a top of mind question like that on the slide. If you had to choose one thing that identifies Niagara, what would it be? These sorts of questions were based on the assumption gathered from the literature, that people would draw on hysteri his historical narratives as a significant contributor to their identities. We were also careful not to mention the past. In other similar research, scholars have determined that residents often have a lively engagement with their pasts. However, we noted that in these projects, 
the researchers identified their interest in the past in both the introduction to the surveys and in the types of questions they were asking. Our research, and this is what makes it different from these other projects, did not. We hoped to ascertain whether the past would come up on its own. So, in the survey that you see done in 2009 and 2012, you can see that historical aspects, and I would point to it here if I could, did not come up very often. In most cases, references to the past came up less than 5% of the time. Slide, please. These results became even more pronounced when, when viewed graphically. In this commemogram, you can see that we aggregated participants' responses by decade. So, if people mentioned the War of 1812, we would count it in the 1810 category. If they chose the Second World War, we would count it in the 1940s. However, as you can clearly see, a majority chose something or someone or some place that was contemporary. We might add that we did this particular survey, the one you're looking at, in order to probe whether the 1812 bicentennial had much of an effect among residents. Our conclusion was that it was doubtful. Only a handful of people mentioned historic narratives at all, and perhaps two mentioned the War of 1812. Slide, please. When we sorted through the responses that signal contemporary ideas, you can see from the table that across the region, grape and, grapes and wine often garnered more or as many responses than did Niagara Falls, and consistently more than any other response. Sometimes this response even surprised participants. For example, one person shocked herself, stating, wine? And then she paused. That's not what I thought I would have said. I'm not even a wine lover. Our surprise at this response in our initial survey was one of the reasons that we chose a constructionist approach to the research. We wondered whether something about our surveys was skewing the answer somehow. This kind of distribution of responses was, however, typical of all the surveys that we completed. So, one of the questions we began to pursue was, how did the grape and wine industry insert itself into Niagara's residence and identity narratives? Slide, please. We began uh, reading about rural economic and heritage development. Through our reading, we found an older but useful way of exploring the seeming relationship between residence and wine. Christopher Ray, writes that rural, rural regional development often follows a four-step process. The first stage requires that a suitable local attribute can be identified for development. This attribute might be the local culture, the landscape, a specific narrative, which could either be historical or entirely fictional, or any kind of combination of such things. Second, that attribute and its qualities must be sold to non-residents through a marketing strategy. Third, attribute, attribute developers must promote the product to residents. And finally, Ray argues, residents must internalize or take for granted the attribute and its narrative as an authentic element of regional culture. After reading this, it seemed to us that regional officials and entrepreneurs in Niagara followed the first three stages of this model. So given this, we tried to sort it out. Next slide, please. So given these ideas, we started to think in terms of wine marketing and regional place branding. That Niagara identified grapes and wine as an important resource is nothing new. I was happy, for example, to recently come across a number of videos on the Grape and Wine Festival that dated from the 1960s and 1970s. You can see a still of one of the videos on the screen right now. That the product reached beyond the region is exemplified by the range of celebrities that participated in the festival. In 1964, for example, the festival hosted an ex exhibition hockey game between the Chicago Blackhawks and Boston Bruins. And events were hosted by Canadian TV personalities like Betty Kennedy and Fred Davis. And the event was even visited by the recently ousted Prime Minister, John Diefenbaker. 
What strikes me about these early festivals is the reach that they attained in drawing famous visitors and hosts to the events. Next slide, please. We were also particularly interested in the ways in which wine entrepreneurs and place marketers drew on the agricultural heritage of the region. Niagara's agriculture was a selling feature early on. As early as 1902, for example, travel companies were featuring excursions to take in the famous fruit belt along with Niagara's quaint small towns. By 1932, Grimsby had organized a month of activities to coincide with blossom time. Moreover, and using extremely colorful imagery, CBC radio personality John Fisher, who was also known as Mr. Canada, noted in a broadcast dated to the late 1940s, and I quote, St. Catharines is self-assured, poised. She looks at herself and murmurs, yes, I am good looking. I've got background. I've got money coming from industry. My country estate is rich farmland. I've got a future. I'm growing fast. I'm sitting pretty. Yes, Canadians, Fisher continued, St. Catharines is a peach of a place. Promotional materials, even for industrial St. Catharines, as pictured on the slide, made reference to Niagara's identity as a national garden land. And as a final example, in 1968, a government report made plain the importance of tourism in Niagara and how the agricultural landscape was an important feature of this. And I'm quoting, tourism depends very much in the Niagara region on the attraction of the landscapes. Sightseeing, for example, has been given by 83% of American visitors to the area as their major interest. The general economic growth of the area will increasingly depend on its environmental appeal, on the amenities of the natural and man-made landscape. From this point of view, the effort that is now being expended on the idea of a tri-county scenic drive along the Niagara Escarpment is sound, but the whole concept is meaningless if the scene, the charismatic landscape of the area, is not preserved. Next slide, please. We still see these themes of merging the wine industry with agriculture and promoting agriculture in the region more generally in more recent Niagara promotions. Many of you might remember the controversial Shake Off the City campaign of about 10 years ago. In it, the ad creators illustrated the rural idyll of Niagara versus the congestion and noise of Toronto. The connection to our research in this particular ad is obvious. Can you play the ad please, Dan? There might not be sound for this, um, again, technical glitch, but there was just background music um, on the ad. Upbeat, happy, but I'm not gonna hum it. And I can't see whether the ad is finished. So I'll just continue on. The Toronto couple in the ad is learning about wine in their condo. However, their approach is obviously flawed. They're learning about wine on a computer and the recommended wine is demonstrably awful. However, a trip to Niagara and a tasting amongst the vineyards is a perfect anecdote, antidote, sorry, and the couple find a lovely red wine to consume. It goes without saying that people in Toronto hated the campaign and successfully demanded that it be scaled back. But even the most recent advertising, the image on the right, for example, is a page from the Wine Country of Ontario Travel Guide for 2021, extols the virtues of small town agricultural Niagara. Next slide, please. A number of other key developments occurred with this continued stream of advertising, but also point to the intertextual messages of the importance of grape and wine as significant to Niagara. It is perhaps most important that Niagara wines had really come of age by this time. Thanks to the pioneer of the new wines, Niagara wines had gained in international reputations and were winning prestigious awards. And these awards were covered in various media. We also need to mention the designation of the VQA 
and the Niagara Appalachians in this context. BQA designation gave Niagara wines a distinct and legal profile amongst foreign and domestic rivals. At roughly the same time, cultural scholar Carolyn Chere notes that wine marketing began to really take off. Though it started with relatively low budget efforts, by the 1990s, promotional materials began to feature thick glossy paper, professional images, quality printing, and features about individual winemakers. The free and widely available food and drink, for example, appears at least according to the Back Issues catalog in 1993. The mid-2000s are also an important time in this discussion. By this point, a long period of massive deindustrialization had decimated employment in St. Catharines, Welland, Niagara Falls, and Port Colborne. The region badly needed a new direction. We can't go into too many details here, but it is important that grapes and wine feature heavily in economic development reports and in both regional and municipal urban plans. In 2013, for example, the Niagara Chamber of Commerce claimed, and I quote, Agriculture is one of the pillars that built Niagara's economy, and it continues to be a significant contributor to the overall GDP of the region. The growth of Niagara's wine industry and the emergence of value-added agricultural production processes has created more opportunities for growth in this sector." End quote. In all, vineyards and wines were becoming important to outsiders, but also increasingly to residents of the region. In all kinds of ways, grape and wine, along with tourism, were becoming key economic drivers. Next slide, please. While many of these moves were intended for outsiders, they also had an impact on residents. This would build an, on an already recognized link between Niagarans and local agriculture. The regional government, in a 2003 report, for example, noted that, and I quote, Niagara, being one of the oldest settled parts of the province, is particularly rich in history. Our agricultural heritage in urban families is sustained today through parents or grandparents who grew up on farms, through celebrations of agriculturally based festivals, such as Thanksgiving, and in the ability of urban families to escape to their roots in the farmlands and rural communities that are still accessible from our cities. End quote. Thus, and intended for local audiences, grape and wine industry leaders also built on the traditions of agricultural fairs, such as the long-standing blossom festivals that mark spring and the agricultural harvest fairs in the fall. As we all know, the grape and wine, while sometimes controversial, has been a well-attended annual event since the 1950s. Indeed, Wine marketing has created an almost year-round grape and wine event calendar that caters to both tourists and residents and has included things like the Spring Sparkle, the Homegrown Festival, the Grape and Wine, the Cuvee Weekend, and the Ice Wine Festival. In this way, the wine industry was able to make inroads into the cultural life of Niagara residents as well as contributing to local economies. Next slide, please. At a micro scale, individual wineries also made use of local associations, mainly to differentiate themselves from competition within the same appellation or terroir. Association with a specific past, like a long family history or authentic seeming artifacts, becomes a potential resource that complements and extends the unique characteristics of a wider wine region. Thus, if a winery has a pedigree rendered visible by old buildings, its own vineyards, and intriguing stories, then it has both tangible and intangible assets that are prized by marketers. These assets are identified in the literature as winescape atmospherics, or the human dimension of terroir. As Joanna Fountain and Daisy Dawson put it, and I quote, the past becomes a resource and through a selection process driven by political and marketing imperatives, the history of vineyards and winemaking processes are interwoven with the broader heritage and cultural traditions and narratives of the region. Thus, as we did a content analysis of winery websites, we noted that many make explicit links to a local past. And we highlight just two examples on the slide here, 
and note that they go back years or generations. These words and images provide irrefutable evidence of the long association of Niagara's wines and agriculture with the region. Moreover, we noted that wineries themselves often reflect these heritage narratives in material form. Cultural scholars Carolyn Charest and Nicholas Baxter Moore likewise believe that Niagara's wineries achieve this historic association. First, they argue, some wineries reproduce the ar architectural styles of Europe's renowned wine regions. Second, some wineries embrace local landscapes as a central feature. Some, as we mentioned, have adopted the built heritage of the Niagara region by repurposing the buildings and landscapes of working farms. Such facilities usually incorporate existing farmhouses, barns, and other outbuildings. Third, some wineries erected thoroughly contemporary architecture. The facilities that share this aesthetic share little else in common. However, we notice that most of these facilities work in relation to the landscape by incorporating the horizontal lines of surrounding fields or by offering postmodern readings of iconographic Canadian buildings, such as cottages. Slide please, Dan. So while we were able to demonstrate that Niagara's grape and wine has fulfilled the first three elements of Ray's fourfold development of a rural economy, we had yet to ask whether or not Niagara residents were buying it. Had they internalized or made their own the heritage associations of Niagara grape and wine? This was one of the big questions we had emerging from our survey data. After noting the incredible top of mind association that participants shared in naming wines, we sought to explore whether or not residents viewed this viewed local wines as a heritage narrative. Next slide, please. To begin, we might revisit the data derived from our surveys taken across Niagara. Overall, we noted that residents living north of the escarpment identified markers that were very closely aligned with the region's contemporary place brand. Participants did not always name the falls or wine exclusively, but the most common alternatives were allied elements that evoke the falls and wine in marketing materials, things like the landscape, the climate, and agriculture. Residents living close, or sorry, south of the escarpment identified the same markers and elements, but far less frequently. Beyond the predictable public or commercial markers of the region, residents in the south also identified aspects of their own intimate experiences of life in their hometowns. Next slide, please. However, when we ask the big question, is wine part of Niagara's local heritage narrative? The overwhelming response was yes. Somewhat surprisingly, when we asked the question, are grapes and wine part of the region's agricultural heritage? The answer was an even more resounding yes across all regional municipalities in which we sur surveyed people. Next slide, please. To put the 2012 results in context, we sought to understand participants' relationship with the wine industry. To begin, we wondered whether visibility might contribute to participants' ability to draw on grapes and wine so quickly. This map, produced by the amazing map librarian Sharon Jansen, demonstrates that north of the escarpment, vineyards and wineries are really highly visible. This distribution also helps explain, perhaps, why residents of Welland and Port Colburn were less likely to have wine as the top of mind response than were people in Virgil, St. Catharines, and Grimsby. Next slide, please. We then sought to explore how residents were engaging Niagara grapes and wines. Our surveys turned up a bunch of interesting data, and I don't really have time to go into a lot of detail, but some of the important things include participants indicating that they had frequent exposure to grapes and wine that varied from drinking it, obviously, but also in terms of participating in wine events. Perhaps more importantly, participants noted that they went to agricultural events, saw agriculture as an important heritage narrative, and also included wine as important to that. These types of things serve two important roles. 
One, they certainly drew residents into the agricultural and small town narrative that place marketers created. But second, these kinds of experiences, which we learned were often multi-generational, also merged into family stories. This we found of people who had picked fruit, went to markets and participated in fall fairs, went to wineries and went to grape and wine. Grape and wine was actually very important among these. And for example, in a mid-COVID love letter to the grape and wine parade, for example, Sarah Nixon of the St. Catharines Museum wrote, and I quote, local celebrations like the Niagara Grape and Wine Festival are knit together with the spirit of the community. Such public displays are only as much as the meaning and feeling that people give to them. Feelings of community pride, identity, and belonging can only be cultivated by people who share in the festivals. I hope that reading this brief history of the festival can bring back a few memories and recollections. And even more, I hope you can stir up a certain feeling or sense connected to grape and wine. That is the essence of community spirit fostered at such public celebrations." End quote. Moreover, and given our research interests, we wondered where participants were learning about local grape and wine and wine-related activities. Important here is that in almost all cases, most participants learned about wine and wine-related activities through wine marketing efforts. In other words, the kinds of branding efforts of which I spoke a few minutes ago. In this way, wine entrepreneurs, place branding marketers, and local governments, we think, have succeeded in building a local heritage narrative that residents have in fact internalized and made their own. Next slide, please. This research suggests that grape and wine are certainly useful to Niagara residents. Scholars of culture remind us that individuals try to render their lives meaningful as best they can. We think it is significant that local grapes and wine provide people with a positive identity narrative in times when deindustrialization has ravaged the area. This was a fairly common response among our participants. Wine was something positive with which to identify. Participants who improved of the brand saw two main benefits. First, they acknowledged that the wine industry provided investment and employment benefits in a weak economy. For example, one participant told us, it puts people to work in an economically depressed region. The Wine Fest Festival brings all sorts of people to the region that wouldn't be here otherwise. Participants also seemed to be impressed that wine could provide a positive economic niche which residents could support. One participant declared, I'm very proud of it. It makes you feel good that we recognize it and promote it. BQA and local wine is promoted across Canada and it is a very good product. This leads to one of the most important conclusions of our work. From the very start, we wondered whether all the efforts put into monuments and historic sites were working. Did people buy the histories of the region as a part of who they were? The answer to that was a resounding no. We discovered over and over again that the vast majority of major history narratives for the region did not dwell top of mind among participants. Indeed, many of those narratives were, <clears throat> excuse me, drifting into a distant past. They had little resonance with contemporary um, residents. Given the conceptual frames we were using, we did, however, find that people were able to choose from among the various heritage narratives, and in this case, chose those that work for them, namely grapes and wine. It's important, however, that people do not make these choices free from social, political, economic, or cultural power. The Niagara wine brand represents the efforts of entrepreneurs and governments to build up a particular brand for the region. And therefore, this represents a particular form of power. In building a brand, its champions are not necessarily interested in reflecting a region's identity. In fact, critical scholars of place brands would argue that they are actually generating an identity. More importantly, this brand might not reflect the identities or interests of all residents. Certainly, our research demonstrated a fair bit of local resistance to the wine brand. In answer to our open-ended questions, some participants who answered questions about local heritage, both positively or negatively, identified the wine narrative as a false and sanitized version of what they believed to be the region's actual identity. 
Among the concerns, they listed things like the replacement of soft fruits by grapes, concerns over food sovereignty, concerned about the, concerns about the gentrification of the Grape and Wine Festival, and a concern that the region was trying to build an image that is pretentious and inauthentic and which caters to rich visitors rather than locals. Next slide, please. To conclude, I'd like to revisit the research as sort of a whole. The motivations of governments, entrepreneurs, and place branders may be well known, but the responses of Niagara residents or, Niag or residents of any place to their efforts are not. Are they proud of past residents and the parts they played in nation building, major engineering works, or things like the Underground Railroad? Do they identify with them? Do they internalize values and assumptions captured in stone? We're not the first to consider these types of questions, but our research does differ from similar projects. We did not ask participants how they engaged with the past. Instead, we asked participants how they think about their communities and then compared their responses to narratives marked by local mnemonic products. We pursued a constructivist approach to our surveys, adjusting our questions as we progressed in order to test our assumptions, our tools, and our results. Given this process, participants' sustained identification of grapes and wine as significant heritage identifiers encouraged us to make an unpredictable transition from monuments to wineries. That said, Future research into Niagara's mnemonic products and practices requires further methodological and conceptual innovations. Our surveys, for example, provided answers to our initial questions, but they represent popular and mostly white engagement with local mnemonic traditions. However, they may not account for the differences in identity markers that potentially emerge from close attention to intersections of ethnicity, class, gender, or sexuality. And this work, remains to be done. And that concludes. Thank you very much. And we can move on to questions. Sorry, Dan. Next slide. All right. Turn my camera back on here. There we are. Well, thank you very much for that. That was really, really interesting uh, research that you're doing. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Let's see. There we are. Um, so a, a couple of questions. Um, one that one that I have is when you started that work, um, did you go into it with any expectations uh, of, you know, what the awareness and and identification, uh, you know, beliefs of people in Niagara would be? Were you surprised at all by by where you landed? Oh, absolutely. Um, we started out by thinking about what the literature was telling us about monuments and historic sites and those things, and the things that they're supposed to do, which is to give people a sense of themselves and a sense of their past. Um, so we decided that given that this literature existed and that it was suggesting that people would buy into these things, we thought, well, let's test it. And so we designed a bunch of surveys to try and go out and see whether or not people responded to monuments and historic sites. And what we found was that they didn't really at all. Um, and in fact, as I showed on that one graph, people were generally, when we asked top of mind questions, thinking about contemporary things. So this really shocked us in the first instance. Um, and like I said, we tried to shift up our questions and the types of questionnaires we were at, um, using to try and see if this was actually something that was really happening. And well, it was. So yeah, we were really shocked. We had no idea when we started this that we would end up talking about wine. No idea at all. As, as somebody who uh, I, I was born and raised in Niagara here and, and uh, was actually born in Niagara Falls, I'm always interested um, in how people don't like to embrace Niagara Falls, the tourist destination. And um, if I think if you did the same survey and asked how many people had visited Niagara Falls, you know, specifically the tourist area, um, I don't think you would see, for example, I, th I think the question about 
how many people from Port Colborne uh, visited wineries, and it was 36%. I can't right. imagine that you would see that same number. What does that say about what people embrace in Niagara? It, 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 that that figure seems not maybe not surprising, but it, but that's a really interesting figure that 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 many people across Niagara are going and visiting the wineries. It's not just that they identify Niagara as as grape and wine based, but they're actually active participants. Yeah, it's it. We thought that was really interesting as well. Um, and when in one some of the open ended questions that we asked when we started, people would give us responses that sound very much like some of the comments that you just made. So when we talked about monuments and going to see monuments, people said, well, these, these are things you don't do um, in Niagara. Those are tourist things. Um, so we don't go visit monuments like we don't go to the Maid of the Mist or to Niagara Falls. So I think there is a sense there that tourist destinations in large part are something that you avoid um, because you do that when you go on vacation, you don't do that in the place where you live. The winery seemed to be some, somewhat different than that in that for whatever reason, people, when we talked to them in Port Colburn or Welland did make um, the point that they were going to wineries. So we thought, well, one is that this is and been really well marketed and the sale of Niagara wines has certainly gone up and gone up locally. Um, I don't have those stats on hand, but I do know we mentioned that in the book. Um, so it could be that people are traveling throughout the region, stopping at wineries while they go different places, um, you know, to visit family or to go to work. Um, they're not staying put in Port Colburn is the, is the um, short answer to that. Um, but we also think it has something to do with the fact that people have these positive associations with the wine industry generally in the sense that it is something that the region has that is positive. Um, one of the things that we noticed in doing the surveys, we did the first one in 2005 and the last one in 2016, was that as we worked forward, um, there were more and more negative social comments that people used about their towns or about the region generally, um, which reflects, I think, sort of deindustrialization and a sagging economy. Um, but the wines were, again, something that people looked at positively. It was something that they could say, yes, we have this. So I don't know if that ex answers your question exactly, but it, it does. Yeah, it, it does. And there definitely is that, um, that it's unfortunate, but a, a negative association with uh, the tourists, the prime tourist areas, I think, um, you know, whether it's the traffic issues or higher prices and things like that. And I do think that's something that is not, um, that, that's, that, that's not matched in, in the wine industry and in the, in the wine market here. Um, for sure. okay, another question for you is, so where does your research go from here, uh, you know, on the impact of grape and wine and regional identity and local heritage and the impact on MAG residents? What's, what comes next? Um, to be honest, we haven't really thought about that too, too much. Um, as part of the research, we've spent a lot of effort in the last little while um, thinking about um, Private Watson and some of the debates around that that emerged particularly after Black Lives Matter. Um, so that has been um, sort of occupying both Russell and I a great deal since then. And in fact, we've got uh, a paper that has been submitted to a um, edited collection dealing with, with Private Watson. Um, but I do think there is room for a more nuanced sort of thinking about um, the grape and wine industry and local perceptions of it. Um, for example, we can think about sort of class and the way class cuts through the region. You know, we did have one person who talked to us about how, you know, that this was all very strange, um, this wine business. Um, you know, his family had come from Europe and, you know, in Europe it was okay for, for men to drink wine, but here um, men largely drank beer and spirits. Um, so, you know, those kinds of, of differences, I think, are important. They're important to recognize. Um, they're important to think about as place branding moves forward. 
um, and to see what this means and how it might disrupt as well as enhance people's um, identity and their identity links with the region. Last question, somewhat related to that. Uh, if you if you had to guess where where things are now, and I realize that that's guessing is not uh, is, is is not something that's <laughs> particularly scientific. Uh, but do you think that that connection between Niagara residents and the grape and wine industry has strengthened since your your last research, or it, or do you think it has it it has maybe there's been a decrease in that connection? Oh, that's tough to say. I, I, I couldn't, I don't, I don't think I could answer that um, without any data to support it. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, like I said, it's, it's a positive thing. And a lot of people are happy to associate with that. Um, and it may be that, you know, as we sort of slowly move forward out of, you know, financial recessions at a global and national and regional level, people are looking for those positive things to associate with. Um, so maybe, um, can't say for sure. I think uh, there's also more recently with the pandemic and especially early on in the pandemic, I noticed even in our own family, um, you know, we were really trying to support local. And yeah. I, yep. I, know, I know the business you know, not the business model, but uh, the, the options available out of so many wineries changed um, where it was easier to support local wineries and, and in breweries as well. And so I think it, my own feeling within my own family is that our connection to the wine industry has strengthened over the past two years because of that sense of supporting local, you know, and, and supporting what's in your own backyard um which it, if there are any positives that have come out of all of this that's that i think is one of them but. oh you make an excellent point and anecdotally you know i can say something about that you, you know your family my family um certainly we've been trying very hard to support local businesses and you know local wineries um you know if you if you can't go anywhere um you can spend an evening sort of tasting local wines, right? Um, so yeah, it, it's it's a um, certainly a greater appreciation for myself as well of some of the sort of fantastic local wines that that we have access to. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, thank you very much. I really want to uh, to take this opportunity to to thank you uh, for joining us and giving this presentation. Um, also to your colleague, of course, Russell Johnson for for his work in this area. And um, I think the the work that both of you uh, have been doing is is important research. And obviously, it's uh, it's work that we're looking forward to seeing what comes next for for both of you. So. Um, Thank you everybody who joined us here for today's uh, lecture. And um, just a reminder that the, the video from today will be posted to the, the Brock Covey website at brocku.ca slash Covey. Um, it'll, be, it'll be posted in the next few days. Um, and uh, of course, this is uh, the, the second in a series of 10 lectures over the course of the, the next few months. Um, next week, next uh, Monday, February 14th at 1130, uh, we have our, our very own uh, Covey director, uh, Dr. Debbie Ingalls, uh, who's going to present Tannin Alert, the launch of a new program for Ontario red winemakers to assess uh, skin and seed tannin at harvest uh, to assist in winemaking decisions. And then two weeks later, um, uh, we'll have, uh, again, another uh, presentation from Covey senior virologist uh, Sudarsana Pujari, uh, who will present Emerging Virus Diseases of Grapevine advances in diagnosis and management. So thank you very much, Professor, Professor uh, Rittmeister. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, thank you all for taking in the lecture today. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Dan. Have a good day. You as well.